So listen very carefully. Get closer now and you will see what I mean. It isn't a dream. Who doesn't fondly remember the Carpenters? The brother-sister duo began in the late 60s, but exploded in popularity in the 1970s. Practically everyone was listening to Karen and Richard Carpenter. And though they became the leading sellers of easy listening, frequently topped the charts, and were one of the best-selling musical artists of all time. They weren't always living on top of the world. While on stage, Karen was in her element and appeared happy, but behind that sweet, sweet smile, she battled demons. I'm Nostalgic Nick with Do You Remember? And today we're going back to the 70s to learn a little more about the incredible highs and tragic lows of Karen Carpenter. If you enjoy this deep dive, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe, click that bell so you never miss an episode. Now we gotta get to the details because we've only just begun. A musical life for me. Karen Carpenter was born on March 2nd, 1950 in New Haven, Connecticut. Her brother Richard, who was three and a half years older, was already considered a child piano prodigy. Then in 1963, a 13-year-old Karen and her family moved to Downey, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. Karen joined band in high school and learned the most popular instrument in the world. No, not drums. The glockenspiel. Yep. But since she didn't enjoy playing this, which is similar to the xylophone, the band director allowed her to mosey on over to proper drums. And the carpenters were beginning to form. Karen then begged her parents to buy her a Ludwig drum set. The drum kit cost $300 at the time, which would be around $2,500 today. Perhaps Karen's parents had a crystal ball, or just immense trust in the musical talents of their offspring. As they agreed, Karen enthusiastically absorbed all the skills she could, and in just a year, she learned some of the most complex drum beats out there at the time. Incredibly impressive. She was even awarded the prestigious John Philip Sousa Band Award in 1967, and went on to attend Cal State University at Long Beach, where both she and her brother Richard were members of the choir. Now that the siblings can easily rock out together, it was time for the duo to hone their singing chops. The choir director recognized Karen's potential and gave her further lessons to develop the three octave range that she became known for. A drummer who sang, Karen's first band, 2 Plus 2, was a group of three girls from Downey High School, but the band split up after Karen asked if her brother Richard could join the group. Apparently 2 Plus 2 did not equal 4, so Karen and Richard formed a new group with one of Richard's college friends, Wes Jacobs. They called themselves the Richard Carpenter Trio. Karen was on drums, but she didn't sing for the group, and the trio signed a contract with RCA Records and made two instrumentals that were never released. Wes Jacobs left their jazz trio in 1967 to further his classical music education and later joined the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. So it was just Karen and Richard experimenting with new sounds before one more short-lived band called Spectrum was formed. All I can do is try over But their middle-of-the-road sound didn't provide much success, besides opening for Steppenwolf early in their career. A Genie and Three Wishes in 1966, the Carpenters had a session with Joe Osborne, who was so impressed with Karen's singing ability that he signed her to a contract with his label, Magic Lamp Records. Did Karen just stumble upon a genie in a bottle? What three wishes would she make? Well, Magic Lamp Records quickly folded, and they were back on the hunt for a label. They made their first public television appearance in 1968 as the Dick Carpenter Trio on your all-American college show, and with Karen drumming and singing Dancing in the Street, obviously they moved on to the finals round, as the Carpenters were beginning to get some traction. They continued making demos with Osborne, and one of those demos, sent to Herb Albert at a and Records, did the trick. And in April 1969, Albert signed the Carpenters to a contract saying of Karen's voice, quote, It touched me. I felt like it was time. 
Wish number one granted. Karen was the drummer and co-lead singer for the group, initially singing from behind the drums, but you could barely see her as she's only five foot four, and a few audience complaints about not having a true focal point forced the pair to make a change. As the band's front woman, she was catapulted from behind the set and into the limelight. Karen wasn't comfortable at first, but she adjusted, and in the latter years, she only drummed at special live shows or on the occasional album track. But before we move on, on from Karen as a drummer. Let's hear her shred for just a beat. The Carpenters became a huge pop sensation, achieving commercial and critical acclaim in the 1970s. They won five Grammys and were nominated for four more. But with all this success, you wouldn't have guessed that both of the Carpenters were struggling with personal issues in the mid to late 70s. They even had to cancel a tour in 1975 due to Karen's weak condition caused by an undisclosed eating disorder. The Carpenters took a hiatus in the late 70s after Richard had developed an addiction to quaaludes and decided to seek treatment. Karen took this chance to record a solo album with producer Phil Ramone, but her brother and record label hated the music, and it wasn't released until much later and after some remixing. Some of the songs were released after her tragic death, but the entire album was finally released in 1996. Wish number two granted. When it comes to dancing, my body keeps changing my mind. So what could have been Karen's third wish? She wanted a conventional life, to be married and have a family, but knew deep down that her touring job would make that very difficult. Until one day she met Prince Charming, or so she thought. Much like Cinderella, Karen married Thomas James Burris after a short courtship. Burris was a divorced real estate developer with an 18 year old son from a previous marriage. He was nine years older than Karen. To complete the family, Karen wished to have her own children, but Burris previously had a vasectomy and refused to have the surgery reversed. Their marriage couldn't last and ended after only 14 months. Those close to Karen stated that her failed marriage to Burris was one of the worst things to happen to her and also suggested that he was abusive. A tragic final chapter. Karen Carpenter for years struggled with a secret demon that her fans didn't know about. Although many were guessing something was wrong, as she continued to rapidly drop weight. Karen had been a healthy child, but then sometime in high school she decided that she needed to start dieting. She followed diets and remained a consistent weight for several years, before seeing a photo of herself from a show and being devastated with how she looked. She was thin already, but hired a personal trainer in 1973 hoping to lose weight, but then fired them again after she began gaining muscle. So Karen began her own fitness routine, which obsessively counted calories. The gifted musician lost over 20 pounds in an extremely unhealthy way. And by late 1975, Karen was officially gaunt and very underweight. Many fans recall gasping when she stepped onto the stage, seeing how skinny she was with their own eyes. She was also taking various different kinds of medication to aid in her unhealthy weight loss, even going as far to use her married name and stage name to get duplicate medications. Karen finally admitted to Richard that she had a problem in 1981. Prior to this, Richard and her parents didn't know what to do for her in that time, and still today too for that matter. Eating disorders are very hard to talk about, and the family didn't know how to communicate their worry. But Karen's condition continued to worsen until in September of 1982, she was admitted to a hospital in New York. She was extremely weak. The doctors gave her an IV with the nutrients her body so desperately needed, and they were successful and helped her gain some weight back. Karen returned home to California in November of 82, and she continued making public appearances and making new music with Richard. On the 1st of February 1983, Richard and Karen had a meeting about their upcoming tour. Little did Richard know, this would be the last time that he saw his kid sister alive. Three days later, Karen woke up in the morning feeling pretty normal, but then she collapsed in her parents' home. And when paramedics arrived, her heart was barely beating. She was rushed to the hospital, but her frail body couldn't handle the trauma any longer. And Karen Carpenter 
the light to so many in the 70s, tragically passed away at the young age of 32. It was later discovered that she had suffered heart failure from complications of anorexia. The term anorexia was not really used in public until the tragic passing of Karen Carpenter. Obviously, her family, friends, and all of us were devastated. Her career was thriving, and she had been such a positive light in the world. Her family decided to set up a memorial in her honor. The Karen A. Carpenter Memorial Foundation researched eating disorders and how to help people with the resources that they need. Today, it's called the Carpenter Family Foundation, and it now supports many charitable causes, highlighted by eating disorder research. Her family sought to make sure that other people knew the dangers of eating disorders, and to show that there was help out there for people who needed it. Today, there is a National Eating Disorder Association hotline where people can call, text, or chat online with a professional. So if you or someone you know needs help or is struggling with an eating disorder, please contact your doctor and get the help you need. Do it for Karen and do it for yourself. Karen Carpenter's legacy still lives on today. Rolling Stone named her one of the top 100 greatest singers of all time in 2010. And her voice, it just stays with you from here to eternity. No one can match Karen's voice. So let's toast to Karen Carpenter. What was a favorite song of yours that the Carpenter sang? Or that Karen herself performed? And how did the Carpenter's music affect you growing up? Get in the comments and let's remember an irreplaceable musical talent together. And if you enjoyed revisiting the life of Karen Carpenter with us, please consider clicking that thumbs up. It really helps a lot. And subscribe to our channel so you never miss a throwback. From all of us here at Do You Remember, thanks so very much for watching.